Hi, before I get into this one, I need to say that um, the main source of misinformation and the main culprit is Sky Sports F1. They are the people that we need to hold to account um, and they're the people who we will be taking legal action against. And it actually um, may be something that we do will be to actually take legal action against individuals such as Martin Brundle and David Croft, because they are guilty of um, giving the world misinformation on purpose. So that is something that we need to do. I'm not suggesting that we do the same against uh, individuals that are presenting misinformation on YouTube, but this is part of the problem. We have big YouTube channels that are also hugely guilty of spreading misinformation which many followers of the sport will go to for a second second opinion after viewing the Grand Prix after listening to Sky Sports um, many will go to YouTube and see what the big YouTubers are saying about it now there is one called driver 61 and he has over a million followers and if you just type into the YouTube search bar Driver 61 Abu Dhabi, you get this list up. Forget the top one, that's just an advert, but you get robbed. Was Lewis Hamilton robbed? Okay, now if I um, click on this one, this has had two and a half million views. Two and a half million views. Now it's. Booking.com oh, makes tripping. it easier for you to be a part. Let me just pause that. Um, I need, well, I've got to go through this. I'm going to pause my video while this advert plays right there. Right, sorry about that. That's what happens with uh, often on YouTube. So if this one is uh, 12 and a bit, 12 minutes, 15 seconds long, I'm going to go through a different one because it's easier to go through a different one. This one, he covers the incident on lap one. He covers the uh, driving by Perez in holding Hamilton up. And then he goes through the rules at the end and and the whole thing is is flaccid it's just fluff um, and I could rip it apart but it's easier to do the other one and the other one shorter so I'm going to go through that one I might come back and do some an analysis of this one at some point but the other one's more important but the, you need to look at what's going on here this video has had two and a half million views and Look here, 63,000 likes and 20,529 comments. You know, it's what's he got there? There's a pinned comment there. Um, well, Pergio Ceres is the real goat. That's by himself. And that's got 5.8 thousand likes. Who do you think deserve to take the win? Oh, it's another one of these. Oh, let me know your opinion in the comments section. <sighs> right. This guy is making huge amounts of money out of producing videos on YouTube. Now, I don't know the exact uh, amount that people earn on YouTube. Um, a, a conversation I've had with somebody else, and they don't know for sure, but it was suggested to them if the, if you produced a video on YouTube and it got a million views, you would make around about £5,000. I don't know how true that is. I don't want to be spreading misinformation. So if that's inaccurate, I apologise. But let's assume that that is correct because that's the only information I've got to go on. Let's assume that that's correct. If you make a video that's seen by a million people, you make five grand. He'll have made twelve and a half grand out of this video. And it's crap. Okay. Now, he's then made... Um, the next one down in that list, uh, which uh, was, did Formula One break their own rules? Okay, now this one's shorter. This one's eight minutes, six minutes, six, eight minutes, six seconds long. So that's the one I'm going to go through. Now, um, this one has been seen by um, 687,000 people, 687,000 views. Remember, this guy's got a million, 1.04 million subscribers. So a million and 40,000 subscribers. That's the size of this channel. 20,000 likes. 
all right so this video alone assuming five thousand pounds income per one million views this video has met has netted him somewhere between three to three and a half thousand pounds just for this video now i'm going to go through it and i'm going to show you just how absolute rubbish it is but 687,000 people have seen it and have had their minds influenced by it and 20,000 of them like it now before i show you what he says i need to just show you um which was the test upload if any of you have seen that show you that video to show you what actually happened in abu dhabi so that that's fresh in your mind so that then you can understand exactly what is wrong with what he says so i'm going to just go down here to this video and play you through this to show you what actually took place from the moment latifi crashed here we go okay this is just a very short video to show you um what was going on at turn 14 on every lap from the moment of latifi crash so this is lap 53 from lewis hamilton's perspective Turn 14, so turn 14, yellow, yellow, entering it now, stay left, stay left, stay left, staying out, staying out, safety car, safety car, keep the delta positive. Okay, so that's lap 53, and that's just after the T has crashed. Right, this is uh, now tucked up behind the safety car, this is as we go by on lap 54. We lose, we would have lost track position if we had pitted. Okay, lap. Safety car's going way too slow. Yeah, just stay off the debris. That was lap 54. Okay, lap 54 going past the scene. This is going to be lap 55, just approaching the scene now. Note the uh, crane removing lap uh, Latifi's car. This is lap 55. And also look at the track. So stay hard left, uh, five cars between you. Okay, so that's lap 55, still a load of white stuff all over the track. Still likely that there's carbon fibre needing to be removed because the crane has only just removed the car. Lap 55. And here we come up to lap 56. Sight of the crash, lap 56, the orange... Um, overalls they're worn by the marshals as they are on track and just departing the track by getting over the barriers now this is lap 56 and if I continue this on one two three four five six seven eight I'm just pausing it so we don't get this blocked on copyright we've gone eight seconds now what you've got to realise is the race director cannot give the order for lapped cars to unlap until the clerk of the course has checked everything and then given him the message to say, yes, I'm satisfied that the, the racetrack is safe. You can now go through your procedures. So Massey, even at this stage, is not in a position to give the order to the lapped cars to unlap okay hamilton is eight seconds past this incident if you look on uh see if i can go to um track of you Max Verstappen. okay look at where they are now well there's a slight like it's not quite in sync because hamilton well actually it's, it's quite in sync because hamilton hadn't gone round turn 16 at that point but hamilton's eight seconds past the site of the crash but the last car has not passed that incident yet and the clerk of the course is waiting for these cars to go by do his checks and given the all clear by the time that that all clear will come hamilton will be on lap 57 so the earliest that um, massey can give the order for um releasing the lap cars is on lap 57 okay and even if it was at the end of lap 56 even if he gave the order just before they crossed the line on lap 56 uh, sorry uh, 
at the end of lap 56, before the start of lap 57, Mick Schumacher is a lapped car. Now, he is the white dot at turn 14 now. There is no way that he is going to get past all of them cars that are in front of him and Hamilton and the safety car prior to lap 57 commencing, which means lap 57 is the lap in which they will be passing the lead cars and the safety car, which means lap 58 is that mandatory safety car lap. That's the only valid ending of the race. Lap 58 is a safety car lap. The end result is the race order as you see now, barring any retirements. That's that's a fact, okay? Anyway, back to the main the main video. Okay. So, if I go back onto where we were, let's go through um, Driver 61's breakdown as to, and his video entitled, Did Formula One Break Their Own Rules? Now, if I, um, let's just rewind this then, and let's hear what he's got to say. So, in that chaotic last Grand Prix at Abu Dhabi, all of the regulations seem to go out of the window. The TV Yep, can't disagree. He crashed and sparked it all with only four laps to go. The race dictator, I mean race director, Michael Mass. Uh, four laps to go, well there was lap 54, 55, 56, 57, 58. There were five laps to go, but you know, let's not split hairs really. He made some odd decisions, but did he break his own rules? Well, Mercedes predicted. You're asking the question, right? And you, you know, you're, you're putting it out there. Did he? Right where you should categorically be saying he did. But when you ask the question, that gives the people that want a certain outcome a reason to be able to argue it their way. OK, but you like to sit on the fence, present this. Oh, I'm balanced. I will give this perspective and that perspective and I'll let you decide. But there's a million people that are tuning into you. Two and a, you know, two and a half million saw your other video and they're looking for your opinion. OK, but you do this on purpose because what you want is you want everyone to subscribe to you, whether a Max fan or a Lewis fan or just a general Formula One fan. And you don't want to alienate anybody. But what you're doing is contributing to the misinformation and this will be proven say yes and Red Bull predictably say no so let's go there's the balance Mercedes will say he's broken the rules Red Bull will say he won't so let's see over the rules as well as the arguments from both sides let's go so as we know on lap 54 out of 58 Latifi stuck it in the wall meaning that at least two or three laps of safety car was needed to clear up both the Williams and its barge boards that were scattered all over the track so OK, at least two or three laps. So let's let's break this down. Uh, Hamilton went past the scene on lap 53. We saw it on lap 54. So one lap later on lap 54 with the white smoke. On lap 55, which was two laps later, we saw the crane. And three laps later, as he went by on lap 56, was when the marshals were departing the track. So three laps it took. Um, from and Hamilton was only a few seconds behind the Latifi incident when Latifi did crash. So we're saying it took three laps to clear the car and the debris. Now, that's standard. If you go back through all the accidents of Formula One, when a car crashes on a track, particularly a street circuit, OK, but when it's a normal racing circuit and there's runoff areas, that can sometimes be a quicker process. But street circuits, where you've got to get uh, cranes on track, three laps to, to do that clear-up procedure is, you know, about standard. OK, so the this clear-up operation wasn't um, delayed. It wasn't um, any slower than standard. And in a standard um, way of dealing with it, it's dealt with under a safety car situation. You don't red flag it unless you detect... Um, severe damage or damage to the barriers which render them unsafe so you deal deal with the situation with the safety car in the manner that it was 
But once it's cleared up, then you have to do the safety car procedure. But listen to what he says about it. But at this point, Lewis couldn't pit for fear of losing track position to Max and then the race not getting started again. That would have been a real blunder, imagine. So Lewis stayed out and Red Bull, for obvious reasons, tried something different and boxed Max for some softs. However, half the field didn't follow Max in, leaving Norris, Alonso, Ocon, Leclerc and Vettel who passed, putting themselves between You've given misinformation there. You're suggesting that Max um, went into the pits, but because the others didn't, they then got in between Max and Lewis. Well, the reality is that at least, I think it was three of them were between Lewis and Max anyway. And I think it was just two of them. I can, I can double check this. I will recorrect this if I'm wrong. But... In fact, let's try and do this now. I'm going to pause this and we'll, we'll double check. OK, here's the proof. Um, turn 14, Bottas's um, turquoise dot is covering Latifi's dot now. But, but he's just crashed. Hamilton's down here. So in between Hamilton and Verstappen, you've got Norris, Alonso and Ocon. So there were already three cars in between them. Um, Ricardo pitted. And then, because Verstappen went into the pits, Leclerc and Vettel went by, and Verstappen then emerged behind Vettel. Um, so that's where, why there was then five cars in between the, uh, Hamilton and Verstappen uh, in that safety car train. But there were already three. Okay, so let's come out of this and go back to uh, his analysis. But he's now saying because he pitted. There's five cars. Well, there, there were already three, which were these three here. And it was only Leclerc and Vettel that put their sails there due to him pitting. OK, we'll carry on. Between Hamilton and Verstappen. And so Michael Massey, the race director, has a few choices. Either red flag the race, meaning the order would be restored. Everyone. OK, that's not a choice. OK, you do not red flag a race. Just because you want to red flag a race. There are certain criteria for doing it. And those criteria are, number one, the track is blocked. If the way that the cars, the crash is, the incident is, is that cars cannot safely go through that site, you red flag it. That's number one. That's criteria one for red flagging a race. Criteria two is if a driver needs medical attention. So if Latifi had have been there and then needed to send the ambulance there um, and um, the medics and it was that serious, you would red flag that situation. You wouldn't want the medics having to deal with an injured driver with the safety car train going by every minute and a half, two minutes. So you'd red flag it in them circumstances. The third circumstance that you would red flag it is if... Uh, the barriers need repairing and the time it would take to do so would take too much time out of the race. OK, it wasn't it clearly wasn't that sort of scenario. So it didn't require a red flag. You know, the only other reason would be if it's unsafe to be racing. So if the conditions are the visibility, it's that bad in the rain, the visibility is that bad. You would red flag it then. None of them things were happening. This was just a standard incident which would be cleared under the safety car. That's a standard operating procedure. So this option that you've proposed of it, of an option being a red flag, is totally inappropriate. But again, you're giving misinformation to people saying, well, he could have done this. No. Stop it and explain to people what I've just explained. Explain to people the criteria as to what the process is and when you would use a red flag and when you wouldn't. And this is a situation where you would not use a red flag. And the race situation, the championship situation is irrelevant. OK, if it was the first race of the season, if it was the fifth race of the season, if it was the 10th race of the season, you would not use a red flag in that situation. If it was lap one, if it was lap 17, if it was lap 30, if it was lap 55, you wouldn't do a red flag. You would clear it up with a safety car. So you don't make any changes to that because just the, because this is the last race of the season 
it's the last few laps of the last race of the season and there's just two guys can can be winning the championship. Because every race is a Grand Prix. Abu Dhabi was a Grand Prix. All 22 rounds of the season were Grand Prix. You operate each one in the same way as you would a set of league fixtures in a football competition. It's not a cup competition where you have extra time and penalty shootouts and do something different because it's a knockout. Okay, It's a league season. You play your game, you collect your points, you add them to the total. And that game takes place in accordance with the rules of every other game in that league season. That would not have been a red flag situation. That's number point number one, disproven. Everyone could change tyres and there would be a fair 1v1 four lap battle for the championship. Even so... A fair 1v1 four lap battle for the championship is what he proposes. But again, a red flag is not applicable. So you've again talk through a scenario which is not applicable. So Massey would have had to call this straight away and it would have been an unusual call when neither driver nor the barrier looked to be damaged. Option there you go. And uh, you said it would have been an unusual call. Well, it's, it's nothing to do with it being unusual. It doesn't fulfil the criteria of using the red flag. That in itself would have been a decision made entirely for drama. Entirely to facilitate this dramatic end to the season. And we should not be manipulating sport to try to create drama. So don't try to validate that. As I say, if you'd have done this in race one, race two, race three, race four, race five, just because it's the last race of the season... It's no different. Option two would be to finish the race under the safety car, which understand. Option two is to finish the race under the safety car. It's not an option. If it's possible to go racing, you go racing. If it's not possible to go racing, you finish it under the safety car. It's not optional. It's dictated by how the circumstances play out. So don't put it forward as these are choices that the race director could have made. OK, it is something that is dictated by what takes place. Understandably, they didn't want to do this was they didn't want to. It's, you can't make a choice. If it takes that long to clear it up, it takes that long to clear it up. It has to finish behind the safety car. OK, it's not about, oh, well, we don't want to do that. Oh, well, we don't want to see a football game and nil nil. So we'll find some way of manufacturing one of the teams to score a goal somehow because we don't want to see it and nil nil, do we? Well, you wouldn't do that, would you? Why? Because it's not authentic sport. a definite possibility. Red Bull did take this risk when pitting Max. They didn't know if there would be any racing laps before finishing the race. And Red Bull took no risk when they pitted Max because Max did not lose any position. OK, so don't present that Red Bull took a risk by pitting Max. That's not true. It was a free pit stop. The driver in third place was not going to pass him whilst he was in the pits. That was a free pit stop. And anyway, pitting didn't cost them any positions. So they. So why did you present it as being a risk? Gambled. Option three would be to keep the on-track order and create a one-lap battle at the end. That is one... Absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. He's presented option three of keeping the on-track order as it is and a one lap race off now i'll show you why that is not possible and this is what he should be doing because this is the misinformation that so many people still believe so many people jump up in the comment section and have no clue of what they're talking about and it leaves the likes of me having to argue with twats that jump up in the comment section with with absolutely no knowledge whatsoever arguing and trying to discredit what I'm saying 
because they've received misinformation from Sky Sports and people like this. Now, this is the situation. Let me enlarge this so you can actually see what the situation is. So, we've got, just coming to turn 13, we've got Latifi and Mick Schumacher. And when they get to turn 14, this is when Latifi crashes. I've paused it here because when Latifi does crash, all this bunch is bunched up around by turn 6, turn 7. And so you can't see them clearly. Right. But what you everybody needs to understand this. OK, we've got Lewis Hamilton in first and then here is Max Verstappen in second uh, in between turn six and back to turn five. But what you also have is Lando Norris here in position eight. Alonso, nine. Ocon, ten. Ricardo, eleven. Leclerc, Leclerc twelve. Vettel, 13. All these guys are racing each other. OK, they're all racing each other. Norris is racing Gasly and Sonoda and a bit further up the track, Bottas. Everybody in that Grand Prix is racing for position. OK, and as I've said in previous videos, Norris was closer to Gasly than Verstappen was to Hamilton. All right. Norris matters. Norris is trying to challenge for seventh position. He's entitled to do that. Every competitor is entitled to challenge for the place in front of them, as they are in every Grand Prix of the season. Just because this is Grand Prix 22 of the season, it doesn't mean you can separate out just two drivers and go, well, the rest of you, it doesn't matter for you. Your race is it, well, it doesn't matter what, that we can block you off from challenging the guy in front. All we care about in this race is who's going to win out of Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen. And we'll put Lewis on 44 lap old hard tyres and Max Verstappen on some fresh softs and give him one lap. And let's see who wins the championship. Because you Verstappen fans like that, yet no part of it is valid. And you've disregarded every other element of this Grand Prix. For that. So this is the situation before the crash. Everybody is challenging for position. Everybody. Look at Norris. Look at Gasly. So Norris at turn six. Gasly it, on that straight a bit further around the track. Heading down from turn eight down to turn nine. Sonoda not that far ahead of Gasly. All right. So if we come out of this one. What that then becomes is this. So this is that when they are behind the safety car. Norris, down here at turn nine, the orange dot, he's had to stay tucked up behind Hamilton. All right? But Gasly is now at the back of this safety car train. Norris is all this way around here. I'm tracing round this entire lap. So having been less than 12 seconds behind... This is how far Norris is now left behind Gasly. You cannot restart that race like that. You categorically cannot do it. So this notion of leaving lapped cars in place and restarting the race like that is categorically impossible. It is untrue. That is the FIA International Sporting Code which actually dictates that. Everything, every decision made has to be based on sporting fairness. And that sporting fairness applies to every competitor within the event. So you cannot allow a safety incident to impact drivers' races in such a way. So that some are hugely advantaged and some are massively disadvantaged in this manner. The only way you can do it is for a uniform process where that restart procedure, all advantages by every driver are nullified. And the restart procedure is in race order with the gaps between each drivers being almost the same. And that is what that mandatory safety car lap is there to accomplish. 
Massey knows exactly what it's there for because there's been four Grand Prix where rather than complete just the one mandatory safety car lap, he's actually kept that safety car out there for an additional lap. And the reason he did that is because those released lapped cars hadn't made it round to rejoin the back of the safety car train. And because they hadn't, he realised that they would, that would be a restart in unfair conditions to them release cars. So he made the safety car do an additional lap, at the end of which those lapped cars that had been released had managed to catch the train. And that's when they went racing again. So Massey knows exactly what the rules are there for. He knows exactly what the purpose of those rules are, is, are, right? And everybody now is lying about this. Now, I'm going to actually play the audio from this. Um, so here we go. By giving the best possible chance for racing to the finish rather than finishing behind the safety car, they've decided the lap cars will stay where they are. By giving the best chance of racing to the finish, they've decided the lapped cars will stay where they are. So, this is David Croft telling the world, worldwide audience that that is what is happening, okay? Which is categorically not allowed to happen for the reasons I've just described. And this that they are uh, telling you is made up. And the reason being, Michael Massey cannot make that decision now, right? He cannot make that decision now. The Sky Sports, they are reading a narrative at this stage. They are telling you now that they, they will not release these lapped cars and that will enable racing to resume. Now listen to this part of the narrative as well, because this bit of radio messages messaging, which took place um, around here in between turn five and turn six, when we are on Max Verstappen's uh, driver cam, we can hear this audio being played between turn five and turn six. F1 TV have chosen that footage and they have chosen to replay it and broadcast it to the world now. Cancel that. Lap cars will not be allowed to overtake. Again, this got blocked on previous versions, so I'm just pausing it from time to time. Yeah, of course. Typical decision. It's classic. Oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so that's the Red Bull being hard done by narrative, which then leads to this notion of, oh, well, Red Bull are being hard done by these lap cars not being released. Um, and that's when we then get the switch of, oh, they are being. So are they being, aren't they being, are they being hard done by, oh, now it's okay when they release just the five, okay? This is all constructed and contrived and it's made out to be, oh, it's a panicked situation and nobody really knew what was going on. This is being contrived right now, okay? Now, the reason why the, the lapped cars weren't being released and this message was coming through, the lapped cars aren't being released. And we'll go to Lewis's head cam again. So where are you, Lewis? Uh, driver cams. Hamilton. Coming round there. Men on track. Okay. That is the sole reason that the lapped cars aren't being released. Okay. And yet, before... That, you know, that is the reason Massey has said, I can't release the lapped cars. And F1 TV have chosen the narrative of Red Bull being hard done by by that. When the simple fact is, safety dictates you can't. The rules of the sport dictate you can't release the lapped cars. And yet we get this, we get these twats. These Max Verstappen fans in the comment section going, yeah, they could have released the cars a lot easier, a lot earlier and started racing earlier. You categorically could not have done that. Sky Sports needed to tell everybody to explain them. And these big YouTubers needed to have done that. But instead, they are, they, they are just actually adding to this misinformation. 
They're adding to the misinformation. And that is part of the problem I have in getting the message out to the world exactly how contrived this was. Because you're getting twats in the comment section dreaming up all these scenarios that they've heard elsewhere that they think they're now right about that they've not got a clue about. OK, and no doubt there'll be people that jump in the comment section. They won't even have watched this video to this point and they'll still be arguing the wrong things. It is ridiculous, but it's all due to misinformation. Yes, they are thick because they don't get it. But part of the problem is they've been misinformed. And it is a responsibility of those in the position of power by having the platform with which to inform. So like I say, primarily it is Sky Sports. You, what you are doing is filthy. But also the huge YouTube channels have got a responsibility. But they're not, they're not acting upon it. They're, they're not taking responsibility. And all they're doing, they're taking the money. They're, they're looking to appease the Max fans and take the money. Now, let's come out of this and let's go back to what else he's got to say. Once Latifah's mess had been cleared up. However, that would have put five bat markers between Lewis and Max. And who knows if he could have made it through them. Or Not even a valid scenario. Like I say, this idea of restarting the race with five cars in between Lewis and Max was never a possibility and yet they're suggesting that was one of the options available not at all although that would have seen some of the best lunges from Verstappen the best lunges from Verstappen look mate you're not at the fucking gym right well clearly you're not right but lunges you, you validate Max these late lunges aren't acceptable the other video you do you go into validating them again but you, you're just a wrong one or option four would be to wave all the back markers through and take the risk that this process would take too long, leaving no time for... Option four is not an option. That is the procedure. So what you do is the procedure I've described. You wait for the incident to be cleared up. You wait for the clerk of the course to declare that situation, the track, to be safe. And then you carry out that procedure. Okay? If the earliest that that procedure can take place is for the, them cars to be released on lap 57, lap 58 is a mandatory safety car lap. There is no overtaking. The race finishes behind as a safety car finish because the earliest that you can overtake is on lap 59, which there isn't one. So you cross that start finish line in that safety car running order. That is the end result of the race for actual racing at the end of the laps. It's also worth noting that Massey couldn't add on extra laps as this isn't in go. the rules and the cars would have run out of fuel. He also took so long to decide that it ruled out the option of the red flag. But re Right, so again, look at what you're doing. It ruled out the option of the red flag. It wasn't an applicable situation for a red flag. This notion of he took so long to decide, no, that that time scale is dictated by the time it takes to clear the incident and declare the track safe. So don't the only the only important thing that needed to be broadcast to the world was the camera at turn 14 showing everybody how long that was uh, to being taken to clear it up. But F1 TV didn't show us that because that clears everything up. If they show us that they show us all that's going on there, how long it's taken to clear it up. Everybody can see. There's no speculation. But now he's suggesting, oh, well, it's Massey took so long. That's not at all true. Massey's just sat there in his little office, seeing this unfold, seeing the marshals on track deal with what is going on, bearing in mind safety, bearing in mind that that car set on fire, bearing in mind we're told that you've got to handle that car carefully so that you don't get electrocuted by the hybrid unit, okay? Then you've got to hook it up to this crane that's got to be dragged from somebody onto, onto track, lifted up, dragged away, clear the track of the debris, clear the track of that powder that's now on track after, after the fire extinguisher process, okay? 
Make sure that the marshals are on track. Make sure that somebody is there with the technical expertise to check them barriers and satisfy themselves that they, they are safe. And if there is another impact there, a driver's not going to get killed because the barriers are weak. OK, these are the things you have to make sure are carried out before you declare that track to be safe. And that's what Massey has to wait for. He can't make the decision before that. So don't don't try and claim to people that Massey took so long. OK, because that's just just lies. Really, Michael Massey didn't take any of these options. He took the hidden option. <laughs> the hidden option. What kind of bullshit is that? The hidden option. What are you even talking about, man? Number five, only letting the lap cars between Lewis and Max go through and not... The hidden option number five, only letting these ones through. Not the other lap cars behind Verstappen. During the incident, Horner, the Red Bull boss, got on the radio to Michael Massey saying, why aren't we getting these lap cars out of the... Do you know what? That's irrelevant, okay? If you are a football referee, you've got the managers in your ear all the time. OK, they're not running onto the pitch, but they're still shouting at you, going, ref, ref, what's this? And the ref will just go, shut up. I'm the referee. Right. And Massey, if he's got someone on the radio to him, do you know what he can do? Just turn it off. Just turn it down. Shut up, mate. I'm not interested in what you've got to say. I am dealing with this incident and I will do it. With, in accordance with the rules of the sport. There's no excuse for that. As a man that is in charge of that event, responsible for health and safety, responsible for making sure it takes place in accordance with the rules, that's what you do. You do not get swayed by outside influences. That's your job. You, are, you have been selected for the premier role in the premier version of motorsport. You've got the pinnacle role in the sport, at the pinnacle of the sport. It's like being, it's like a 14-year-old kid being selected to referee a World Cup final. A novice that doesn't know. You wouldn't do it. So don't try and make excuses for Massey, okay? The way, which of course, as a dedicated team principal, he's going to do. So, so let's validate Horner. Horner yells one thing, then Wolf yells the opposite. And I have to question why they have a direct line to the race director. Anyway. Okay, that adds the drama, doesn't it? And that is a valid point. Maybe they shouldn't have a direct line. But you know what? Teams have had a direct line to race control for a long, long time. And it used to happen under Charlie Whiting. And they say that Herbie Blash would deal with these communications and just say, yeah, Charlie will get back to you. All right. Or they just shut them off. They just say, we're dealing with this. Uh, shut up. Unlucky. OK? Have a bit of strength. Only waving through half of them did mean they had one lap left for racing at the end. E OK. Number one, you're validating waving through and you're suggesting that at least gave them time for one lap at the end. Now... This is going off at a tangent because it's not really relevant. But here's the thing. If they let through five, there was certainly enough time to let through the other three as well. Because they would have all got past before the start of lap 58. Now, lap 58 had to be that mandatory safety car lap anyway. OK, that had to be that anyway. So this bit's irrelevant. But... You can't, why are you validating letting five of eight through? Because actually, you could have easily let the other three through anyway. Yes, you could. What did leaving them three in place actually achieve? Well, what it did, there was two cars, which were Ricardo and uh, Stroll. They were in between Verstappen and Sainz. So Sainz in third place was unable to challenge for second place. So we all know what Verstappen does with his overtakes. He pretty much drives the other car off the track. But in doing so, that opens up your inside. So if Sainz could have slipstreamed them down the straight, 
Max done one of his late lunges and driven Lewis off that side of the track. Sainz could have anticipated that and nipped through on the inside and won the race. Or somehow maybe crashed into one of the other two. They, they removed Sainz from that Grand Prix, from, from that duel. There's no, there, there's no rules in any Grand Prix that allow the rules of the event to separate out two competitors in a multi-car event for them to race off for the win. And I stated that on the day. That's the simplicity of it. You cannot just separate out two competitors in a Grand Prix and give them an unfair advantage over every other competitor to race off for the win. You just can't do it. That's the simplicity of it. That in itself would win any court case because there is absolutely no justification for separating out two competitors in a multi-car event and say, just you two can race off for the win. Categorically. Categorically. Even if it did break the rules. <laughs> Even if it did break the rules. So you, you again, you're, you're, you're validating breaking rules. Why would you do that? After that, Massey immediately brought in the safety car, which could also be against those rules. So let Which could also be against... It is against those rules. What is the purpose of it? Well, I've already explained that, but why are you not explaining that? Why are you not explaining that to your 100 million... Sorry, million and 40,000 followers of this channel? to potentially the 2.5 million people that watch your other video. Why are you not saying that? Let's take a look at the wording because it does matter. First of all, Michael may not have been able to call a red flag. The sporting... There you go. He may not have been able to. Well, why is that? It's because it doesn't fit the criteria for using a red flag. Regulations say if the clerk of the course deems circumstances are such that the track cannot be negotiated i.e. the track's blocked safely even behind the safety car the race will be suspended however there is no clear statement on the minimum disruption needed to call a red flag the right and as i've said the time it took to clear that incident was standard that is typical of clearing up an incident where a car has crashed on track and it takes about three laps and, that, and you deal with it with a safety car. Normal. The majority of the confusion came from the safety car though. According to Mercedes, Massey made two main mistakes. The first is about only letting half of the lapped cars through. The regulations say any cars that have been lapped by the leader will be required to pass. Okay, look at that word, required, okay? Any cars that have been lapped will be required. So if you're required, it means you have to. Any car that's been lapped has to. So it doesn't mean you can select, you can pick and choose which ones have to. Any car is required to. That in itself dictates that that word any clearly means all. Any suggestion, anybody trying to argue otherwise is arguing corruptly. Any lawyer that would try to argue otherwise is arguing corruptly. It produced a corrupt outcome, so trying to suggest validity to interpretation of that word that way is a corrupt argument. It is as simple as that. There is no legal argument for that, even though they pretend that there is. They'll go, oh, well, legally, any doesn't mean all. Utter bollocks utter bollocks and any valid court would laugh that out of court they would laugh at any barrister presenting that and just go you are a corrupt bastard for even suggesting that right corruption right so so let's not try and go down this route of any could mean all you could interpret it to mean uh, sorry any doesn't mean all lies rubbish 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 okay the required the car. And look at the implications of not doing it, and that determines validity. Cars on the lead lap and the safety car. Then they said the safety car was pulled in too early, as it came in on the same lap 
that the lapped drivers. Then they said, Mercedes said, right, why aren't you saying it? Why aren't you, as this presented expert of the sport with over a million followers, telling people what it is and why it is what it is, rather than being this fucking flange that's just trying to be nice to everybody and the Max fans and this and that. And what do we think? Oh, let me know what you think in the comments section. Twat. We're waved through. For this, the regulations say once the last lapped car has passed the leader. So once the last lapped car is the last lapped car the fifth of eight cars or is it the eighth of eight cars? Well, unless you are retarded, you will know that it is the eighth of eight cars. The last one. OK, so once it has passed the leader, the safety car will return to the pits at the end of the following lap. Right. So the last lapped car was Mick Schumacher. The earliest that that could have passed the leader was on lap 57. So the safety car returns to the pits at the end of the following lap. So at the end of lap 58, there's your race result. Simple, isn't it? Simple. The, the safety car will return to the pits at the end of the... Marvellous. Let me just um, fast forward this. Uh, in fact, I'll just... Here we go. We've got a pop-up advert. It's four more seconds. I'm not going to skip it. Oh, yeah. Huh. Following lap. And obviously, they broke this rule. But Red Bull obviously had their... Obviously, they broke this rule. Thank you for stating that. But now, here we go again. Arguments too. They said that the word any does not necessarily mean all. Which so Red Bull present every, any doesn't mean all, right? That's corrupt. Red Bull went in to the stewards appeal where Mercedes were protesting that the FIA, in the form of Michael Massey, the race director, broke their own rules by doing what he did. So Mercedes were appealing to the FIA to say, you, the FIA, broke your own rules. So Red Bull were allowed in to that appeal. What is that all about? That in itself is corrupt. If you had been burgled and you felt the police had not dealt with investigating that properly, and let's say, hypothetically, you could um, complain to the Police Complaints Commission authority that the police had not done what they needed to do properly, would the Police Complaints Commission allow the burglar into that process to argue on behalf of the police? Saying, no, oh, no, the police, the police did everything right. That was fine. Would they allow that? Max fans, again, I'll give you the answer because you don't know, do you? No, that wouldn't happen. That's how corrupt this is. Red Bull were allowed into that steward's appeal. You had Christian Horner, Jonathan Wheatley, and you had Adrian Newey. This genius, Adrian Newey, who's also a corrupt bastard, because he went into that steward's appeal arguing for that outcome. That shows you that man's integrity. Which I kind of get, but then we are into the grey area of the wording. We Nothing grey about this, but what you're doing is further validation. Now, there's two things going on out here. Either you're thick, either you don't know, right? Or all you're doing is trying to up ease the Max fans to get clicks and likes and money. That's you. Which, to be fair to both parties, is ambiguous at best. But then nothing, nothing ambiguous about it. I've just clearly explained the exact nature of this. There is nothing ambiguous. Don't present it as being ambiguous. Don't present that it's possible for one thing or another to happen. It was just all a little bit confusing. Not at all. It's really simple. It's really simple.
The main argument is about point 0.15, point 0.3, which says if you all want to turn to page 11, the race director will have overriding authority over the use of the safety car. Essentially, okay, that over overriding authority extends on the grounds of safety entirely on safety and sporting fairness. He has to operate that in conjunction with the FIA International Sporting Code. So that safety car procedure is mandatory. He has his overriding authority to prolong its use. So in those four Grand Prix where he kept that safety car lapping an additional lap to enable those released lap cars to fully catch the back of the pack, that was the race director exercising his overriding authority. That was him saying, right, I have to keep this, this safety car lapping for uh, uh, one lap. I've done that lap, but those lapped cars haven't caught up, so I'll keep it out there for another, another lap. That is within his discretion to do so. Okay? If he feels that it's not safe, to go racing again because although the clerk of the course has said yes this crash crash site is is fine now i'm satisfied that the track is safe there but the race director is saying well actually it's now tanking it down with rain the spray coming off the cars makes visibility appalling and i think if we start racing now there'll just be further crashes so i'm going to keep them circulating behind the safety car for a period of time to see if that eases off and makes it safer safety so it's on the grounds of safety, or it's on the grounds of sporting fairness, with which that he has overriding authority and discretionary use of that safety car. He cannot cut those mandatory procedures short. He cannot freestyle them because it impacts sporting fairness. That is what the International Sporting Code is there for, which all of these regulations are are actually underpinned by. That's a fact. That's an absolute fact. He's saying that Michael Massey can break his own rules. As it Do you think there are rules written which say the race director can break these rules? Here are the rules, but actually the referee can just break them and do what he wants. Do you, is there any sport that you know where... There are, here are the rules of the sport, but you know what? If the referee just wants to break any of these and do his own thing, then that's fine as well. Name a sport where that's applicable. None. Absolutely none. Why are you suggesting that? Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It says so in his own rules. Very confusing. But Red Bull... It's not confusing. It's not in any way confusing. You're, why are you even presenting that as a possibility? Why are you not exposing just how ridiculous it is? Ridiculous. Then followed this up and say that even if all the cars had been able to unlap themselves, it wouldn't have had any effect on the outcome of the race. Well, the race wouldn't have restarted because the mandatory safety car lap was there. Again, why are you not saying this? Why are you just putting these options out there, feeding the Max fans, feeding them with the, oh, well, we could have done this anyway, or this could have happened anyway, and either way, it doesn't matter because we'd have won anyway. <laughs> Twats. And I'm not so sure that this is true, as they most likely would have run out of laps, but who knows? Most likely would have run out of laps. You can state that as an absolute fact. But yours going, oh, well, most likely. For sure. But here's the crux of it. What's the point in having an extensive rule book if the race director can just ignore it? This makes... Because you can't. You absolutely cannot. So why are you suggesting that, oh, but the way the rules are written, you know, the, the race director can just do that. And then the FIA make, make out that, oh, well, now that we've changed this one word in the rules, it's all now different. It's changed everything, which is utter gaslighting, utter lies as well, because clearly everybody understood the rules before this happened. Everybody understands the rules since it's happened and that there's Red Bull fans out there thinking that the only difference is one word now means that they meant something different before and they mean something different now. Utter bollocks.
makes it more of a set of guidelines than hard and fast rules. Red what are you doing? Oh, the regulations are just a set of guidelines rather than hard and fast rules. So what you're doing is suggesting to people that, oh, this is a sport, but there's no real hard and fast rules in it. Shut up, mate. Just shut up. This is just so, it's just such a flaccid account of things. It, it, and this guy's got a million followers. It's disgusting. Ball made the decision to pit based on the rules and Mercedes stayed out based on the same rules. So there you go. You make your strategy calls based on the rules. But now you're going to go, yeah, but if there's no rules, well, hmm. Only for Massey to throw them out the window. And in my eye, that's just not on. But since... In your eye, in your opinion, right, how about you make a statement of fact that is absolutely, categorically not acceptable. But you don't want to do that. You don't want to offend anybody, do you? I don't give a shit who I offend, right? I apologise for my language because that just comes out of frustration, okay? I didn't want to have to do this. I didn't want to have to make videos like this. The world should have sorted this out well before now. Right? We shouldn't have corrupt media in the first place in Sky Sports presenting this bullshit. The rest of the world's media, who are also corrupt, should have called this out. I've written to them all. None of them have. Other big YouTube channels should have called this out. None of them have. Right? Wolfpack started it, but now he's just been muzzled because the sport has reached out to him. So he, won't go he ain't going to re reveal anything else now. Right? And everybody... It's just this bloody lame, flaccid, bloody dick like him kind of go, oh, well, is it this? Is it that? What do you think? Let me know in the comment section. Well, in the background, he's going cha-ching, 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 12 and a half grand for one video, three and a half grand for another. It's the race people have dug up previous incidents. At the Eiffel Grand Prix in 2020, the one that Hulkenberg super subbed in, Yep, that one. Michael Massey directly said, there's a requirement in the sporting regulations to waive all lapped cars past. And that's... See? Right? A requirement. So Massey stated that. Massey has stated that, and I can evidence it, and I can evidence the events that he's done it at. That's why the safety car period was a bit longer than we would have normally expected. And it looks like a clear-cut contradiction. And really, that tells a story. It seems... What story does that tell? That tells you that this has been contrived and it's a narrative. It tells you that Massey knows the rules. He knows the purpose of the rules. Now look at what he goes on to say Massey now says this. That these things are up for interpretation. And that yeah, look at you trying to validate that. That shouldn't be the case. They need clearing up and wording better so that officials can make quick calls that are backed by regulations. So what's... As in... The rules of sport and the officials knowing exactly what they are and just applying them why is there any ambiguity why is there any argument that's that's standard is it not happened since well michael massey came back in this hearing and said that the letting go of the lapped cars was only there so that they didn't affect the racing and this is so this is the bullshit that they gave you in the stewards appeal so in the stewards appeal after the race Mercedes are appealing to the four stewards saying the race director, part of the FIA, didn't follow the rules of the sport. Then four stewards need to assess, is that true? Did he follow the rules of the sport or did he not? And it's quite simply, no, you're right, he didn't. So therefore we have to reinstate the, uh, the result to be the running order at the end of lap 56. Lewis wins. That's, that's the simple simplicity of it. Instead, they let Red Bull in there to, pro to propose a counter-argument to that. Ridiculous. Massey wasn't even in the, appeal, uh, the stewards' appeal at that stage. Then, after some recess, Massey comes back in with Red Bull and tells everybody, oh, well, the purpose of releasing the lap cars is so they don't interfere with the race between the leaders, which is utter bollocks, OK, because that's not its purpose. And I've given the example in the 2019 Brazilian Grand Prix, Pierre Gasly had been lapped. He's then released because of the procedures carried out, as it always has been. And Pierre Gasly ends up finishing second in that race. So 
if the purpose is for him to be released out of the way so he doesn't interfere with the racing between the leaders, what was he doing finishing second in that race? So don't give us the utter bollocks. And then don't you, as a YouTuber, right, an expert of Formula One with a million followers, don't you present this to people watching this as if you don't know the reasons. Because if you don't know, you ain't good enough. And if you do know and aren't telling people, you're doing this for the wrong reasons. You're doing it for money. This is because the whole point of letting lap cars through is so they don't get in the way of the racing. So in Mass's opinion, only letting the ones between Max and Lewis through made sense. In Mass's opinion. In, right, why aren't you calling this out? Right, this is the only time it's ever happened this way. Right, and they are making up bullshit excuses to validate it. Right, why aren't you calling this out? Why? Because you don't care, all you care about is money. You've got no integrity, okay? The sport has got no integrity. You're giving misinformation. You're validating people's misinformed thought process. And this is part of the problem of misinformation in this world. Then the important bit. Apparently, there's been a long-standing agreement between all of the teams that Formula One racing, where possible, would be settled under green flag conditions. Okay, when was the first time you heard this? And I would say the first time I heard that was in the aftermath of Abu Dhabi. So, we saw the Belgian parade, where actually no race ever took place. But they, they paraded the cars round for two laps behind the safety car, got the sponsors their airtime, and then they, they told everybody Max had won that. Where, where was the not finishing the race? Well, we, firstly, you've got to start a race to actually finish it. But where was that uh, pre preference to not finish behind a safety car? Okay, we've seen safety car finishes before, and I will be out of evidence to them because they've happened. All right, I'm not going to do it now, but it's possible you can evidence the races where they finish behind the safety car. If that's what the situation dictates, that's what you do. Okay, we hear afterwards, oh, the, the teams had an agreement that the race shouldn't be finished behind the safety car. Well, let me tell you about that. The teams realized, this sport realized that the eyes of the world were on it. We are told 108 million people tuned in to watch that event, which would probably be the biggest ever audience to a Formula One event, a global audience of 108 million people. Now, the sport realized that that was a massive opportunity to both, it's attracted that number of fans and it wants to keep them. Now, if that race finished as a bit of a damp squib, some of those people might have been a little bit turned off. They might have go, oh, that was all right, wasn't it? But yeah, all right. So they had a bit of a get together as a sport. Do you know what? This benefits us if this is an exciting spectacle. So where possible, do you think it would be good to have a racing finish? And all teams would go, well, yeah, we understand what you're saying there because obviously we don't want it to be end as a, a bit of a damp squib because we don't, you know, having attracted 108 million people, it's in our interest to keep them because with that many eyes on the sport, the sponsors have to pay loads more money to us because their brands get seen by more people. The value of the sport increases. Liberty Media's whole value goes from $9 billion to $13.8 billion. See, the benefits of getting a bigger audience increases for everybody. The prize pot becomes bigger. Everybody gets a bigger cut of the pie, okay? All teams, do we all agree that would be preferable? Oh, yeah, yeah, we agree with that. So off Red Bull go, make up their little plan. Everybody's already agreed to it. And that's why you hear the drivers going, why aren't they getting these lap cars out of the way? I thought, I thought we were trying to get for a racing finish. Ah, OK. That's why you hear the drivers doing that. But nobody had heard of this notion before Abu Dhabi. But then all the Max fans go, oh, yeah, the team, the teams all said that they wanted a racing finish. Right. 
Does that mean you can break the rules of the sport to facilitate that? Where in the rules does it say you have to finish each race with a racing finish? No, it doesn't, does it? What if two football teams, what if the World Cup finalists had a little chat with each other before the World Cup final and said, ideally, we wouldn't want this to go to penalties, do we? Because no, no World Cup final should be settled on a penalty shootout. So, you know, let's let's just whatever it, we'll do whatever it takes to make sure one of us wins it in normal time because we don't really want this to be a penalty shootout. And if if you know, you know, if the referee has to give one team a penalty that shouldn't be a penalty, then yeah, you know, we just have to accept that. We'll just chat this amongst ourselves and we'll accept it. Is that okay? Is that authentic? Do the rules allow that? Does anybody that has placed a bet on that event, have they been defrauded by something that has been taken place where the teams involved have acted fraudulently to contrive and manufacture an outcome that's not in accordance with the rules of the sport? But you're trying to validate it. Oh, yeah, well, the team said that they want to just have a, a racing finish. So that's all all right, isn't it? Not if it breaks the rules. That's only, that's only like a, a valid agreement if it's possible. And it wasn't possible in accordance with the rules. So you kick that one straight out the window. That's got no relevance whatsoever. And that's why Michael kind of bent the rules. So Mercedes... Kind of bent the rules. So, okay, what are the implications of kind of bending the rules? Well, by kind of bending the rules, you knew the exact situation that that created. You knew you separated out two cars out of the entire field of competitors for them to race off for a win. You're not allowed to do that. You knew that in doing so, one of the drivers was on 44 lap old hard tyres. The other driver was on fresh soft tyres. Those decisions to be on them tyres were made in accordance with the rules of the sport. You broke them rules knowing what the outcome was going to be. Because, let's face it, if you're going to set your... If you're going to go in, into qualifying to try and set a pole position time, what tyres are you going to do that on? I'd suggest you're not going to choose 44 lap old hard tyres to go and try and compete for pole position. And the reason being, you're going to be two seconds off the pace, at least. So you know the differential between what lap speed Max Verstappen is going to be capable of on them fresh soft, soft tyres compared to Lewis's. So you know the outcome. You know who is massively advantaged. So you know the likely outcome of that event. That is manipulating the result. That is essentially race fixing. That's illegal. That's fraud. You've broken the rules to set that up. Mercedes' protest has been dismissed, but all of the teams have the right to review. Mercedes' protest has been dismissed. Why on earth would it be dismissed? It was entirely valid. You've not even, you've not even touched upon that because nobody has. Nobody has pointed out just how corrupt that appeal to the stewards was. The stewards had absolutely no grounds with which to dismiss the appeal. And they dismissed it. It's utterly ridiculous. And that's what Mercedes are doing. They have been remarkably quiet so far, making it look like they are planning a pretty strong case. And if this appeal does happen, it gets passed onto the ICA. The so clearly he did this video prior to the Thursday of that week where Mercedes deadline was with which to submit this uh, further appeal. But like I say, he's presenting you with this information. He is presenting himself as an expert in the sport. He's got over a million followers. I knew straight away that you cannot separate out two competitors to race off for a win. That was a simplicity. I'd not read the rules of the sport. Who had? Nobody that follows Formula One, that there'd be a, a minuscule percentage of people that had read the rules and regulations. But we know what they are. We know what happens in a Formula One race. We know what's standard. And some of us know why. You didn't need to read the rule book to understand why. 
I just need to have a brain and an ability to understand, an ability to critically analyse what is actually going on and the implications of that, to understand what the rules are, why they are what they are, and by not doing it, why it produces corrupt outcomes. It's pretty simple. So why can't you articulate that to people? Why haven't Sky Sports ever explained it to people? And the reason they haven't is because it enables them to get away with gaslighting people and enables them to actually give the narrative that they gave in order to produce the fixed outcome that this sport contrived. International Court of Appeal. It's essentially a court that settles disputes in motorsport made up of 36 elected judges who essentially police the officials in all of if he's talking about the World Motorsport Council who effectively rubber stamped the FIA report then what's going on there because if there is an above body which looks at the facts of the case and allow it to have been dealt with in the way that it has then they are corrupt as well it's ridiculous because the simplicity of the matter is the manner in which I'm articulating things. It is clear that the outcome of the 2021 World Championship was entirely changed by what took place. There were no alternatives. There were no other options. The safety car finish was the only possible outcome and provided Lewis Hamilton completed the race distance, he was world champion. And the empirical evidence is there that Lewis Hamilton completed the race distance. He didn't crash out. He didn't suffer mechanical failure. There is one outcome and one outcome only. Lewis Hamilton is a 2021 world champion. FIA racing. This has happened a few times recently. Haas appealed Grosjean's penalty for an illegal flaw in Monza and failed, and Kimi and Antonio's penalties in the 2019 German Grand Prix, and they also failed. But they all took months to be resolved, and they were much smaller issues than this, so it's not over yet. And really, it's understandable that now the FIA are considering cutting the direct communication between the race director and the teams, which Okay, if that's what they want to do, fine. Don't blame the situation on that because, again, this is another thing. They're trying to divert and they're trying to um, throw into the situation that many different excuses, okay, where they're side issues. They are side issues, all right? That's a simple thing. All right, we're no longer going to let the teams talk to the race director. Fine. The race director could be strong. He could easily have a little mute button. Teams, the team's um, trying to contact you, Michael. Shut up. I'm busy. Simple. Okay, it is as simple as that. In my eye, makes sense. When in the Champions League do you see managers running out onto the pitch and telling the ref what to do? Anyway, well, clearly they don't do that, but they're still shouting at him from the sideline. But does that referee capitulate and go, oh, oh, yeah, I'll do exactly what you tell me to do, or does he just ignore them? Just ignores them, and actually, he'll go and book them if he thinks that they're giving him too much grief. If they're talking out of turn, he'll book them. He'll impose a sanction. And that's what you can do as a race director if you think that the team principal is being out of line. And Christian Horner was being out of line because he was acting in opposition to the FIA International Sporting Code. He was contravening the FIA International Sporting Code by saying what he was saying to the race director. That's a fact. That is punishable. Hey, what do you think will happen? Thank Here we go. What do you think? Let me know in the comments section what you think. Thanks very much for watching. Check out these other videos which I think you'll love. And I'll catch you in the next one. Oh, let me come out of that. This is what we're up against, right? This is what we're up against. People presenting things for clicks trying to appeal to everybody and offend nobody, right? That is what they're looking to do with a flaccid account of things that tell nobody anything but just try to validate or tentatively go, oh, well, it could be this and this is a bit controversial. 
and it's misinformation and it doesn't inform anybody or educate anybody about anything. And that makes the job of exposing the clear cut corruption extremely difficult. So this guy, a million and 40,000 followers, there's going to be maybe 709 people that get to see this. What chance have I got? And the other YouTubers that I'm trying to appeal to and reach out to, to say, you've got bigger platforms than me. How about you expose this? Which I did to Wolfpack. And that, part, that guy's been muzzled. Because there's messages I've sent to him and I can prove them. And the guy goes, yeah, I'll have a look. I'll have a think about it. That was months ago. Shh, not said a word, has he? Not said a word. Right. We, this is part of the problem. Social media misinformation. And people with opinions that are just wrong. So we've got to find a way of getting the facts out there. This video is far too long. There'll be a proportion of you that will, will see this through. But we need to find a way of exposing the truth to the masses and getting more and more, maybe smaller YouTube channels, to start putting the same information out. So if you've got the ability to produce something similar to what I'm doing, do so. Okay, if you, if you end up becoming a channel and making money out of it, good luck to you. Okay, use any of my content. I'm not precious over it. We need to get the information out. That's all that matters. OK, we need to start making people aware of exactly what went on and the true level of corruption, because actually when we get more and more people aware, this thing will build and build and build, build and the corruption will be exposed and this this will be overturned. This will be overturned and the corruption will be then held to account. But we've got to do this as a collective of people. Thanks for your time.